I'd like to welcome you all here today and thank you um, to this conversation with Professor Holmes Ralston III. Um, if I could briefly introduce myself, my name is Tom Murray. I am the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication Speaker Series Coordinator. Um, of course, here at the YPCCC, we are a uh, part of the broader YCEC, um, where we tend to research um, kind of the factors that influence people's behaviors and attitude about the environment, and then how we can use that research to better understand and better communicate messages about the climate. And so today um, we have Holmes Ralston III. Um, I'm actually not going to be doing his introduction because this is a co-sponsored event, um, both with Environmental Humanities and the Yale Forum on Ecology and Religion. Um, and we're also lucky to have Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker, who I believe would like to say a few words. So thank you, thank you, Tom. Thank you all. Nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, Steve Latham of the Bioethics Center, wonderful, and Steve Dunsky, and uh, worked on Aldo Leopold and so on. Um, so just wonderful, and students, Brooks Lamb. Um, someone, is, I think, has some background noise. Not sure where that's coming from, but... Um, so we are very, very privileged to have today Holmes Ralston III, who actually spent a year here at Yale uh, with the Bioethics Center quite a few years back, um, along with a year later of um, Baird Calicott. No. Uh, Tom, is there any way you can mute, mute people? One second. Okay, looks like yeah, we're good to go. Good. Um, okay, so Holmes Rostin was born in 1932, so you do the math. Um, he has longevity here, which is really quite remarkable. So may we all uh, live as long and be as productive as Holmes Rostin. Both his father and his grandfather were Presbyterian ministers, and he himself got an MDiv degree and is a minister as well in the Presbyterian tradition. Um, he went to Davidson College, which has Presbyterian affiliation, and he did physics and math there. He graduated um, in 53. The, uh, his PhD in 58 was from Edinburgh University, and some years later, uh, quite a few, he delivered um, the Gifford Lectures which are some of the most distinguished lectures in science uh, and religion. And that book was published, Genes, uh, Genesis, and God. And he delivered those lectures in 98-99. He has been a professor at Colorado State University since 1968, um, teaching courses in environmental ethics and, and many other areas, I suspect. Um, but he also won the Templeton Prize in 2003, one of the most distinguished prizes in uh, science and religion. One of his books called uh, um, A New Environmental Ethic, uh, A New Millennium for Life on Earth, uh, I think is one of his best books. And he's also done one called Three Big Bangs, Matter Energy, Life and Mind, trying to show the continuity between uh, all of these areas. Um, now, I might just say very briefly, one of the most important things that Holmes Rostin has done is giving us a deep sense of the intrinsic value of nature. Some people have worked on animal ethics and so on, which is very, very important. Some people like Baird Calicott worked on the land ethic, but Holmes Rostin did really the whole. Um, the ecosphere, the biosphere, the land sphere, the species sphere, sphere and, and humans, clearly. But one of the most important contributions he made as well is to say that facts and values are not separate. Because as we understand ecology more and more, the intrinsic value of these ecosystems, um, their incredible complexity, the awe and wonder that they evoke, um, link us up with facts about the ecosystems have values. I think this is an extraordinary contribution of many. And I'll just end by saying 
there's an amazing biography, a wonderful biography, autobiography, well, no, biography about Holmes Ralston called Saving Creation, uh, which was published in 2009. A wonderful, wonderful book about an extraordinary person, a remarkable scholar, and a great contributor to the sense of the value of nature intrinsically for all of us. Thank you, Holmes, for being with us, and we look forward to your comments. Well, thank you for a rather generous introduction. <laughs> so, Professor Olson, if you'd like to uh, start the PowerPoint, I think we're all ready. Ah, here we are. Wonderland, Earth, and the Anthropocene Epoch. Tom, is there some way I can see everybody's pictures on the side or not? Yes. So if you um, if you hover your mouse over all of the windows, um, you should see on the left. There's a couple options, and one of them says "Show Grid View," and that should show you everyone. Show Grid View. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I see, at least I see uh, some of them. Okay, uh, Wonderland Earth in the Anthropocene Epoch. I want us to think about a Wonderland planet. Then I want us to wonder whether humans are in some sense the wonder of wonders on the planet. Then I'm gonna wonder about those who are calling themselves Anthropocene humans. They want to manage the planet and bring an end to nature. I'm going to wonder now in a different sense about whether this is a, an Anthropocene arrogance and end perhaps with the thought that we are wonderful humans and we are incarnate on a wonderland earth. Maybe this is a wonderland planet. Here's Michael Collins, an astronaut. Earth is to be treasured and nurtured, something precious that must endure. Well, we are taught that there is a cosmic anthropic principle if we listen to the physicist, uh, they may say there's such a thing as a cosmological constant, which they abbreviate with the Greek letter lambda. Here's Martin Rees, a famous British astronomer. Fortunately, Lambda is very small. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here because it affects um, the evolution of the universe. It, it affects its expansion and eventual fate. That seems remarkable. There are four principal forces, we are told. The strong nuclear force that holds the, the nucleus of atoms together. The weak force that makes the sun, permits the sun to shine. And electromagnetism and gravitation, all those have to be about what they are for us to be here. So we hear that there's an extraordinary fine tuning 
for a big bang, we have an extraordinarily special big bang, says Roger Penrose, a, a British astronomer. Paul Davies, another British astronomer, uh, currently in the United States, says we hit the cosmic jackpot, a universe just right for life. Well, once there were no species on Earth, now there are some five to 10 million. And once there were no brains on Earth, and now we have uh, large central nervous systems, matter energy in our surprising universe has entered into information states. Organisms are tested, we might say, in evolutionary history for how much information they contribute to the next generation. In a way, that's a survival of the fittest, but in a way, it's a survival of the senders, that is to say, those who can send life into the next generation. So a kind of a cosmic wonder is that the startup seems a setup for life necessary, but not sufficient. But Earth has life otherwise rare in the universe. In a way on Earth, life starts up, then it smarts up and Wonderland Earth is both necessary and sufficient life. Lewis Thomas, famous biologist, Earth is the only exuberant thing in this part of the cosmos. A good planet is hard to find. Well, humans and their planet are we the wonder of wonders? Humans are, in a certain sense, the most complex and startling species. Uh, we, we are the only species who ask who we are, where we are, what we ought to do. Uh, the explosive growth of the human mind, maybe, is the principal wonder on Earth. Here's Ed Wilson, Harvard University. No organ in the history of life has grown faster. Uh, here's Craig Venter, who decoded the human genome, calls the human brain a, a massive singularity. Here's uh, Michael Gazzanaga, neuroscientist. Explosion in human brain size makes us hugely different. The differences, he says, are light years apart. That's a long ways, light years apart. What sets us apart, many to think, is a theory of mind. It's a system that no other animal has. If you worried about listening to this lecture, here's what makes it worthwhile. You can think one raised to the 70 billionth power thoughts. Hmm? We have hyper immense possibility space. Uh, we are capable of what we call top down causation. Uh, 
we can have a kind of transcending overview. Maybe we could say we are the genius on top of this wonderland planet. We can wonder if maybe we are the wonder of wonders. But now we got to ask, how can and ought we to be on top? Well, we hear people say, we humans have entered the Anthropocene Epoch. We've entered the first century in 45 million centuries of life on earth in which one species can maybe wonder if we can manage the planet. Human dominated ecosystems cover more of Earth's surface than wild ecosystems. Agriculture, construction, and mining moves more Earth than the natural processes of rock uplift and erosion. So the International Commission on Stratigraphy, Stratigraphy has said, well, the Anthropocene is a geological unit. And yet it's become a kind of elevator word. Uh, it's, it's being taken up and said to be a word that describes our special place. Here's the economist. We got to use human ingenuity to set the planet up so that it can accomplish its 21st century task. We're going to have, the economist says, 10 billion reasonably rich people on a geoengineered synthetic earth rebuilt with us in center focus. American Geosciences Institute, the Anthropocene is humanity's defining moment. Humans, others say, are the ultimate ecosystem engineers. Mark Linus, we are the God species. Michael Schellenberger, Ted Nordhaus, saving the earth means we're going to have to create it and recreate it for as long as humans inhabit it. So we're told we in the Anthropocene epoch, we're going to enter the designer world. We're told we live on a planet of no return. We'll have human resilience on an artificial earth. A new geological epoch ripe with human directed opportunity. Well, now I'm beginning to wonder about these Anthropocene humans, but it's a different sense of wonder. I've got some doubt and uncertainty, not astonishment and marvel about those who want to rebuild our Earth. We're told we're going to have a managed planet and the end of nature. Special issue, Scientific American, two central questions. What kind of planet do we want? What kind of planet can we get? Well, we're told we're going to find ways to put the rainfall where we want it. 
We're going to find ways to stop hurricanes. We're going to find ways to stop earthquakes. We're going to find a, ways to redirect ocean currents. We'll fertilize marine fisheries. We'll manage sea levels. We'll alter landscapes for better food production. Generally, we'll make nature more user friendly. Hmm? The living world, we are told by Ed Yoxon, a vast Lego kit. We will have continual rebuilding. Life is manipulability. Our image of nature is coming to emphasize human intervention through a process of divine design. We're gonna have geoengineering. We'll put some particles up in the sky. We'll put some aerosols in the sky. We'll put up some re reflective balloons. We'll fertilize the oceans. We'll spray up reflective clouds. But others wonder, these schemes about rebuild geoengineering are fraught with uncertainties and potential negative effects. Here's Michael Soule, the wondering, worrying, the term natural might disappear from our vocabulary it's already gone in many places. We're changing the physical and microbiological environment and we've been doing so. We are living through the end of nature. Hmm. Now I want to wonder, well, maybe what we are Hearing is Anthropocene arrogance. A planet we are going to manage or attempt to manage to have more profits, suit ourselves better, wants to exploit the planet. Maybe we might worry that humans have become Earth's juggernaut predator. We've got a kind of super global colonialism. We might remember that overweening, overweening pride is thought to be the original human sin in Genesis. You shall be as God. Well, how do you like this rebuilt, marvelous future Earth? Royal Society of London, what we must push for is sustainable intensification of reaping the benefits of exploiting the Earth. Well, I might, uh, might wonder if the world's oldest scientific society might be well advised to ask about protecting ancient and ongoing biodiversity, about shrinking our footprint. Might wonder whether treading softly is wiser than intensifying our Imperial exploitation. We are to fix the problem. Maybe we got to fix the problem in the right place. We have to learn to manage ourselves as much as the planet. Here's David Below. 
Stakes could not be higher. We stand to gain nothing less than an enduring civilization, firmer understanding of our planet and ourselves. We have arrived at a new geological epoch of our own making. We must make an enduring Anthropocene in geological and civilization terms stretches into an era. This, he continues, is not the end of the world. It's just the end of the world as we have known it. We do have a lot of anthropocentric enthusiasts. They say this power is to be welcomed. That's what we've been doing all history. We've been pushing back limits. We have a belief that life will get better. We ought to hope for abundance and try to get more abundance. That's what economists may call being rational. We want to increase the abundant life. Ethicists may agree with that. We have a right to self-development, to self-realization. It's always desirable and, and now it has become possible. These Anthropocene enthusiasts say, we're not being arrogant. It's just the other way around. We're gonna take the moral high ground. They say classical conservation has been socially unjust. And why has it been socially unjust? Uh, we now want to protect nature that's dynamic and resilient, that's in our midst, not far away. We want to protect nature that sustains human communities. These are the ways forward now. We don't want to cling to old conservation myths. We want, don't want to pursue the protection of biodiversity for biodiversity's sake, wants to enhance those natural systems that benefit the widest number of people, especially the poor. Well, nature has been on earth five billion years and more, life is been on earth. Culture has been on earth some 40,000, perhaps 100,000 years. Now what these exuberant Anthropocene architects want to do is to displace systemic nature and reshape the future as no generation before has had either the capacity or aspiration to do. Well, their intentions sound high. They have a kind of immoral trailer. Forward for me and my kind. Save nature for people, not from people. That could be as much the problem as the answer. This puts us as the first, if not the only location of moral relevance. Justice is just us. This is the Anthropocene we're told, too bad for the non anthropic creatures. We're going to shift from a focus almost exclusively on biodiversity to more and more attention on human well-being. Conservation is fundamentally an expression of human values. We need a more integrative approach in which the centrality of humans is recognized. 
Well, we're told that uh, a lot of species are gone and we don't miss them. Bison, chestnut, passenger pigeon, dodos, tigers, butterflies. Maybe though, this is not sounding like the Anthropocene enthusiasts are taking the moral ground. Maybe they're saying nature is of value only if and so far it supports human enterprise. That puts the whole planet in the service of only one species. Self-fulfilling desires may be intoxicating us. We get addicted to them. We get more and more and more and more of what we want and we accept an environment that's increasingly toxic, degraded, by global warming. In that sense, we might not know our children, our children's children might never know our highest flourishing. We get dumbed down by these ever more assertive self-interest. Amitav Gosh says maybe we are living in the time of the great derangement. The uh, scientists say there's a stark warning. Human activities putting such a strain on earth that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain future generations can no longer be taken for granted. Hmm. Encouraging a new Anthropocene epoch may be a deranged policy. It's far more likely to increase the strain on Earth than to reduce it. Maybe we want to wonder if our only relationship to nature is one of engineering it for the better. Maybe we don't want Earth transformed into an artifact. Is that what you want? Fix it? We can fix it. We'll use our hands to rebuild the earth. Or is that arrogance? Hands are to be used maybe for caring for the earth and not for fixing it. Let's wonder about wonderful humans thinking of ourselves as incarnate on a wonderland earth. We co-inhabit this earth with five to 10 million species and we and they depend on surrounding biotic communities. Maybe there are multiple dimensions of naturalness on public and private lands. Maybe there are various degrees across a preservation, conservation, Anthropocene spectrum. Maybe we should think of landscape zoning Maybe we don't want to think of getting smaller, but maybe we ought to think of right sizing. What's too big? What's too small? Maybe we could now say we ought to save all the wilderness. We can because it's the least sized 
of the landscape zones on the planet. Maybe we ought to wonder about agriculture and say, we need to size human populations as adaptive fits on their landscapes. Maybe we ought to think about our cities. Maybe our cities ought to be right-sized, not forever growing. They ought to be right-sized by keeping them sustainable on their supporting agricultures and ecosystems. Maybe we ought to say we need to keep humans right-sized by keeping them at home on their planet. Edgar Mitchell, an astronaut, suddenly from behind the rim of the moon, there appears an emerging sparkling blue and white jewel, sky blue sphere laced with slowly swirling veils of white. A small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. A small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. Homeland planet. The, the wonder land earth. Okay, now it's time for some questions. Well, first of all, I would just like to say thank you so much. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, and as you had said, we have about 20 minutes for questions if anyone has any. Don't be back. Holmes, I just wanted to weigh in also to, to say thank you so much um, because you're really pointing out <laughs> some important things. And as Tim Weiskel has noted in the chat, uh, geoengineering is very much on the horizon for a lot of the universities. Uh, it's a funding source and so on. Um, but you're pointing to something very different and it's why environmental humanities matter. It's why ethics matter. Uh, and I thank you. But I wanna make sure we get some questions if you want to go into the chat or raise your hand. Well, we've got... Uh... Um, I, 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 this is what, Billy Grassi. Okay. I'd love Billy, to ask a question if that's okay. Uh, Holmes, it's nice so to great you. to um, see and hear you again. And, and uh, thanks as always for um, uh, illuminating these important ethical debates. Uh, I, I, I want to ask about the sort of geological history of the planet as a restless planet, an unstable planet, one that um, uh, has all kinds of catastrophes uh, in the past and also in the future. And how does that in this um, teleology? So we could talk about supervolcanoes and impact events, or uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, the Holocene is only ten thousand years. The last glacial maximum was twenty thousand years ago. Uh, th these are certainly part of our future as a species. I think we'll survive. Uh, I don't think we'll be wiped out necessarily, but that's also a possibility. But I, how do you how do you uh, reconcile this um, uh, uh, this yeah. uh, non? I mean, I support the non-interventionists for a lot of reasons. I think we should. There's a lot of the conclusions that you reach that I agree with, but there I can't I can't forget that the planet, even without. Go ahead, Holmes. I, I've, yeah. The planet in uh, the past has changed in many dramatic ways. And of course, uh, we have to think of that as part of our planetary history 
and we might say in the future, won't the planet change in very dramatic ways? Well, perhaps it will, but of course, not if the Anthropocene enthusiasts have their way, they think they will rebuild the planet constantly if they're smart enough. Well, that's just but more I've the right arrogance. about whether we are that smart. It seems to me that the one thing we know about evolutionary history is that life has persisted in the midst of its perpetual perishing. That's the one yeah. great truth about life on Earth. It has, as long as it's been here, some five billion years, at least three billion years, life has persisted in the midst of its perpetual perishing. Write that down and meditate on that, and that ought to answer your question. I, 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 I'm I not... To say, Billy, Billy, someone else has a question, so Sorry. if okay. that's okay, we'll keep going. But this is being recorded, and, and I'm sure Tom and the group will send out the link to everyone later. But Kurt Miney, who's worked a lot with Aldo Leopold and done a beautiful film with Steve Dunsky on Green Fire. So jump in. Thanks, Billy. We'll return, but let's keep going. We're Kurt. Kurt here. Over to you. Hello, Holmes. Yes, Kurt Miney is going to ask the next question. It, hello, Holmes. I hope. Hi. It's wonderful to see you and to hear from you. It's been quite a while, and to see other friends on this uh, occasion. But I'm so delighted to uh, hear your latest thoughts and get a little insight into where you're at these days. So, I, this is a big question. So I don't expect you to give a full answer, but um, maybe just a few brief thoughts on how you uh, how you're thinking about non-Western indigenous belief systems and especially Native American thought as it intersects with your main your main thesis and your main presentation of your uh, of your stream of thoughts here. Um, we've talked about this in the past and I know you've written about it, but what are your latest thoughts on, on non-Western uh, worldviews and how this enters into the conversation right now? Well, as you say, that's an oversized question because there are about as many worldviews as there are species on the planet if you like, but I can make a few brief comments. Uh, na native peoples lived on a landscape which they loved and they knew how to live on those landscapes. They often had tough times. They had to persist in the midst of perpetual perishing. And they had certain cosmological beliefs, but for the most part, these peoples did not know they were living on a planet. I mean, we Westerners who think we're so bright didn't know for a long time that we lived on a planet, but we discovered that and know it now. So that in a certain sense changes perspectives about what you have to do. Now you might say, well, we'll just learn from some of these native peoples how to live on landscapes which they knew how to do for a long time. And sure, we learn what we can about how you live well on a local landscape. But it doesn't follow that, that wisdom will transfer to, to living and saving the planet. Uh, that's a different kind of perspective 
different kind of picture in that sense. So I think we've got to come at it on a kind of a case by case basis and think it through. I think we're going to have radically different worldviews. Every time I study a bit of science, they keep talking about changing worldviews. And the latest things I've been reading have been talking about mutualism. What is mutualism? That's the way in which all species, including humans, are mutually interrelated in a giant web of connections around the planet. All right, think of it if you like, like that. We've got to get a vision of human interrelationships with life, the web of life around the globe. Maybe native beliefs will help us do that, but I think it's going to take greater wisdom than we are likely to find without expanding our visions. Okay, Kurt, that's it for now. Thank you so much, Holmes. I believe- I'd um, like to just- Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Tom. Oh, I was just gonna uh, say something else just there. Yeah, sure. Oh, please go ahead. Good. No, I'll make my comment at the end. Keep going. Oh, oh, please. sure. I was just gonna say Adam has had his hand up for a while. Good. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Holmes. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, nature-based solutions or what people are calling natural climate solutions uh, that require restoring large amounts of degraded landscapes or preventing the conversion of currently less disturbed landscapes across large areas of the, of the globe. Um, I think the scale of these solutions means that you could maybe consider them to be geoengineering or what you would call rebuilding the earth. Um, they rely on extensive science, they rely on remote sensing, uh, management interventions that would require pretty large investments of human ingenuity. Um, would you also consider these natural climate solutions like reforestation, afforestation, uh, prevention of forest conversion? Are these also part of what you call Anthropocene arrogance or are they something quite different? Well, they're certainly smaller than rebuilding the planet in that sense. Uh, do I, am I opposed to uh, natural restorations? I want to look at them because it's, sometimes it's hard to put stuff back like it was, but I'm not necessarily uh, opposed to them. And I have worked with restoration biologists in that sense, I have, once again, I'll have to take that on a case by case basis. Usually when we think we are smart enough to know how to do something, we aren't as smart as we think. Typically they're unsuspected problems. So when you start out restoring beavers, for example, as has been done in a number of places, uh, you find that there are a whole lot of problems about what happens to other species. So you have to be very careful. And if you can find ways of doing it partially or incrementally, managing, remanaging it through adaptive management, so much the better. Okay, maybe that's enough. I'll take another question there. I've got Kurt Meyer. Well, I just my... want to... Go ahead. <laughs> I wanted to jump in on that question with Kurt, if I might, uh, Holmes, um, because we've talked about this over the years, but clearly 
um, what the Forum on Religion and Ecology has been trying to illustrate for 25 years is that all the world's religions do have this, this sense of profound interrelationships with nature. They haven't always been foregrounded because as you know, <laughs> ethics uh, has often been human-human ethics or human-divine relations and so on. But it's clear um, that they have this in their traditions. It doesn't mean that they've always followed that um, and, and so on. So that's the challenge right now. But I would also say that indigenous peoples right now um, have been at the forefront of so many of the uh, both protest movements, the pipeline movements uh, and so on. And they are holding to, I think one of the great values you keep reminding us of the intrinsic value of nature more than almost any other group. That's the power of their, um, their call beyond uh, manipulation, anthropocentrism, geoengineering, et cetera. They are saying, this is mother earth, this is alive. These are related systems, water is sacred. Um, so I think their call is very consonant with, coherent with um, your, your life work, which we've all valued. <clears throat> Agreed, and let's not just talk about, uh, well, let, let's change the language a bit to sacred space. They often yes, have nice. a view of sacred space. And if they want to yeah. say, well, we thought about our local landscape as being sacred. Now we know we live on yeah. a planet why not think of Wonderland Earth as sacred space? How am I going to respond? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Holmes. That was terrific. Any anybody else wanting to make a comment? Question. <clears throat> I know. Holmes, uh, I'm um, Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if there's no more um, questions, I know a couple of grad students had asked to stick around afterwards. Okay. If I could just get a show of hands really quickly, if anyone was interested. Oh, okay, perfect. Sorry, uh, Professor Evelyn, I think you were about to say something. No, no, no. I was about to say, I wish the graduate students though, would ask some question right now so we can also hear what you, <laughs> what's on your mind if you like. Um, but I was gonna say that Holmes, I, I just wonder if the position that you're putting forward is um, clearly a minority position in where environmental movements are in a lot of ways right now. And I just wonder um, about your hopefulness of it going forward. Um, and uh, getting some traction. Well, you got to think how old I am. I yeah, am uh, I 87. When I go back and think about what's happened in my lifetime, I can't believe the things that have happened. Uh, you know, students may say, well, we can't do very much. And I say, you're dead wrong. Just think about my lifetime. If you had told me when I was my, the students here's age that we'd have a black president, I'd said, you're out of your mind, right? <laughs> if you had told me when I was a uh, young man, that there'd be no smoking cigarettes on a university campus, I'd have said, you're out of your mind, right? <laughs> and now you can't smoke a cigarette on this campus and on most campuses, right? If, if you had told me that uh, women would come to occupy what the role they do as members of Congress and members of business, 
I would have said, you're out of your mind. I mean, this is what I thought when I was in college. Just so if somebody tells you that there can't be big changes, I'd say, that's absurd. We've lived through some of the biggest changes Earth has ever seen, and we're not done yet. So students have more power than they think. Let's remember Rachel Carson. How, how did she work? She wrote a book called Silent Spring. She called it to the attention of women in their backyards that the birds weren't coming through at their feeders like they used to. There's a silent spring. Mm -hmm. Well, but she said to these women, write your congressman. Ah. <laughs> And these women often knew who Congressman so-and-so was. They wrote Congressman so-and-so and said, hey, what's going on? Rachel Carson said, there's DDT in these eggshells, Congressman. Pass legislation banning the use of DDT. And they did. And more than that, they created uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, right? So, so you can start with the birds in your backyard aren't singing like they used to and end up with the Environmental Protection Agency. That's what I wanna tell students today. Think about Rachel Carson. Or you could say John Muir or many others. You could even say Holmes Ralston, who started <laughs> out relocating the Appalachian Trail and he ends up leading a symposium for Yale University. <laughs> and, and much more. We're so grateful. And I just want to say the Rachel Carson papers are here at the Beinecke Library, and I take my students there, and they are overwhelmed. It's like a cathedral for them to see these papers. But Tom, I'll put it back over to you because I know that we're probably running out of time. But wonderful comments, Tim Weiskel from Harvard and Billy Grassi. I know you probably have more to say. Let's be in touch. And Kurt Miney, all the work on Aldo Leopold and Brian McGurk has been working on an incredible program up at Cape Cod all day long today, uh, Zero Net 2020. Uh, which is really quite outstanding. And uh, just wanting to give shout outs all over the place and Brooks Land with his work on Wendell Berry. So a lot of exciting things are happening, but thank you Holmes so much for being with us. Okay. We should do this another time. Thanks, Tom, your final words. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, I again would also just like to thank everyone here who could make this possible. It was a wonderful discussion. Uh, sadly, we have hit just about 1 p.m. Um, and we do like to keep it uh, on time. But again, thank you everyone, um, especially Professor Ralston, this talk was amazing. I think you really highlighted a view that has, you know, doesn't get enough exposure in our forestry school. So thank you for that. Um, I know some of us are gonna stick around for a, a smaller discussion afterwards. Everyone is free to stick around. Um, and again, thank you so much. Oh, and if I could also plug next week's event really quickly, um, next Friday at noon, we are also having Claudia Malloy who is an environmental activist um, based in the Midwest, who likes to build bridges with traditionally conservative groups by finding common ground. So she's gonna be talking about her experiences working with hunters and fishers and anglers, I believe, in the Midwest and also her work um, fighting against pipelines. So it's gonna be a very interesting time and I'm inviting you all back next week. Thank you. That's great. I just wanna mention Jim Antel, a great leader in climate, uh, Change Climate Action is, is on board, and Mary Southern, who's done a lot of work with uh, Thomas Berry. So anyway, over to this shorter discussion. We can, thanks Tom so much, especially for the students, right? <laughs>
Is it Natalie and Christy who wanted to jump in? Which one of you wants to go first? Sure, I can I can go ahead and start. Um, so thank you again, Professor Ralston, for, for chatting with us. Um, I'll introduce myself just by saying that I'm a second year ecosystems ecologist, um, and I'm fairly new to this realm of environmental ethics. I took Stephen Latham's class last fall, and that was really eye-opening for me. Um, but in coming to this world, I uh, got a bit frustrated because it seemed like ethicists and ecologists aren't talking to each other nearly enough, um, especially when we're trying to figure out a way forward. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, what are the ways that scientists have productively engaged with you? And what would you say to um, someone like myself who's trying to do both the science and the ethics right now? Well, you're gonna spend uh a good deal of time thinking about values and a mixture of science and values. And it's tricky, it's especially tricky uh, with environmental events. If I, if I say that something has integrity, am I making uh, a value statement? Well, sometimes uh, a scientist may say, well, that's just a word about whether things are fitting together well. Uh, whether the water is pure or whether it's got some toxic substances in it. Is it functioning well? That's not yet a value question. But then I may say, well, yes, but integrity is one of those words that does shade over. So if I say a, such and such a person well, is Jim a person with integrity? That is a value question. And you've got to worry about moving from ethical judgments to scientific judgments. And I think in ecosystem studies, that's especially tricky. Tim, how am I, Tom, how am I going to get back? Get back to the slides? You, no, you. I wanted to see you. Okay. And how about Christy? Didn't you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, so, I found this presentation fascinating, and like Nat, I am a um, I'm an ecologist first and foremost. Although my undergraduate degree was in philosophy, and I, I have this real interest in um, animal ethics and environmental ethics, um, but I've been really convinced by a rights based approach, um, especially as we kind of move into you know your talk was about this Anthropocene and human exceptionalism and all of these things. So I was just wondering if you thought a rights-based approach might allow for kind of this integrity to be given to whether it be ecosystems or animals, or whether you think that that, you know, I know you personally take a more values-based approach, but if you thought there was space for a rights-based approach. Yeah. You're just asking about the right approach. Yeah, no, like rights, like bestowing nope. rights upon animals or ecosystems uh, rather than, you know, trying to convince people they have values. Uh, the the I, rights of nature approach, yeah. Holmes, the uh, rights okay. of nature. Yes, I, I believe in rights. I believe in human rights. Uh, I think animal rights has some traction, Tom, Tom Reagan was a good friend of mine, but, but I think the word rights has limits. 
if I begin talking about the rights of beetles, nobody's listening anymore. Or, or the rights of bacteria. I, I want respect for life and that may with some kinds of life involve recognition of their rights. But I, I want respect for all life. I want to respect plants. And I don't find myself able to speak with any ease about the rights of plants, right? Uh, furthermore, I, I want to respect ecosystems. I want to respect uh, endangered species, endangered species, let's say, of frogs. And I don't think the rights language works very well persuading many people there. But I do think the language of values and the language of respect for life does have more traction and it has more traction across many species. When I was uh, raising a son, we went hiking, uh, backpacking, and he would come upon, get, he'd like to get out in front of me, he'd come upon an anthill and I'd find he got there and he kicked up the anthill. Well, when I got there, I'd give him a little lecture on how he had destroyed the home of these ants and he shouldn't do that. Well, I think he listened. Uh, another hike later, same thing. I find him, walked up behind him. He was looking at some ants and he wasn't kicking them. And he was talking to the ants. He said, ants, I am letting your life continue. You should thank me and walked on. <laughs> that is very enduring. Ed Wilson would appreciate that <laughs> for this lifelong study of ants. Yeah. Christy, there's going to be, I think it's November 15th, a panel on the rights of nature um, in the Environmental Justice Conference. So oh, you might want to check that out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We can any also. Other, also Natalie, uh, any other? Yeah, I was going to say we could open Go the floor ahead. to anyone who's even not a graduate student if anyone has any more remarks. I guess I have one other thought or question. Um, I found the, the current literature in conservation ethics to be quite fraught with uh, disagreement and it's almost a stalemate. Nat and I have noticed this kind of, you're either in this camp of compassionate conservation or you're not. And it's, I feel like, you know, there's just li very little dialogue that if you're not within these kind of positions, you're not you're not allowed to enter the dialogue, which has been interesting. Have you kind of run into these similar stalemates as you navigated starting environmental ethics? And, and how did you kind of push forward a view that maybe wasn't in vogue or, or something that people didn't want to talk about? Well, uh, I run into stalemates all the time. Most of my career has been waiting until I might think I saw a bit of chance of breaking up a stalemate. Um, you might look at the work of Brian Norton. Uh, has work on sustainability, adaptive management. 
what Brian says, you often, what you want to do is don't look at how you disagree, find things you do agree about. And so start talking about things you agree about. Keep talking about things you agree about. Then after a while, after you've done this, maybe two or three weeks later, you're talking to these people and say, well, we talked about what we agree about. Let's see what we think we might agree to disagree about. And so then you may say, well, we can live with this. We'll let you do that if, if you let us do this. So we kind of agree to disagree about certain kinds of things. And that may enable some conservation to be achieved. That may mean that the farmers can purify their soil by, by putting some uh, weed killer in it that I don't want them to put in there, but they make that kind of progress takes time. As I said, I'm an old man and I still don't believe the things that have happened during my lifetime. I can see by your face that you're a young woman. You've got what? You've got maybe 80 years yet ahead of you about breaking up some of these stalemates. Go for it and stay with it and Life is going to persist in the midst of its perpetual perishing because of many things that you do. Thank you. I'm going to jump off at this juncture, but I just wanted to thank you again, Holmes. This is absolutely wonderful. And I look forward to keeping in touch and keeping good health. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tom. The one thing I wouldn't have believed, still don't believe, <laughs> is the kind of world we now find ourselves in. It's an incredibly surprising world of the pandemic and, and the way the pandemic has changed us. And let's hope that Christy and her friends are smart enough to learn some lessons from this pandemic mm -hmm. it, and keep this wonderland earth. Exactly. As well, Thomas Berry said, you can't have healthy people on a sick planet. So we're learning that. Tom, sorry, oh, back to you. Oh, that's okay. I was just gonna say, I think if we've learned any lessons today, they've been from you, Professor Holmes Rostin. Thank you so much for this. Um, I know we've hit 115 and that was kind of our end little bit for our little after conversation. Uh, but if no one has any final remarks, I, I hope to see everyone next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, Holmes. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Tom. Bye, Tim.